Ray still had a great deal to learn before he could move his career onto the next level. Although he'd enjoyed some success in the world of rhythm and blues, the real rewards lay in breaking through to the pop market, something few black artists could achieve. But one of the pioneers of black R&B had managed to cross over to the mainstream. His name was Fats Domino. Fats was unique, and, and it was obvious, and everybody appreciated that. He had this fantastic, good feeling about his stuff. His appeal was in that incredibly infectious dancing beat. And then he was the fat man. He was a jolly fat man. So that, there's always a place in show business for the jolly fat man. Crooners are such a threat to guys. All the ladies are swooning over them, and all the guys are angry. Fats pleased everyone in the house, mother, grandmother, son, whoever. And he wasn't a threat to anyone. Because of his relaxed style and his non-threatening attitude, Fats Domino is often remembered as a lovable entertainer. But beneath the surface was a gifted musician, an innovator who brought the rolling piano sound of New Orleans to the mainstream. His slower tunes had a certain air that you can count on. The sound of Fats Domino became so popular that he simply couldn't supply the demand alone. So while he was on tour, Alan Toussaint was asked to stand in for Fats on his records. I didn't dare venture out to try and sh show any other little trills. I stayed what I knew Fats to have uh, given out to us. And I must say it went very well uh, because folk didn't know it was me. His music sounds very easy to imitate. But when he sits down to play, then you say, oh, that's the way it really goes. The Fat Man, 1949. That's Fat's first recording. Detroit City was on the other side. <laughs> People used to laugh at me, I was standing on the corner. <laughs> I never saw him do that again on any other record. Did you ever hear him on any other record do that? That was his way of yodeling. I thought it was great. Fields, we called him Dude, Frank Fields, the bass player. It kind of stunned him to the extent that he turned around and listened to what it was and went right on to the next chord but playing the wrong note. He, the chord changed and he didn't because he was looking at it, listening, listening at Fats. And Cos, I remember Cosmo saying, what in the hell is he doing screaming on the middle of the record? <laughs> Fats Domino was among the first of the R&B stars to cross over to the mainstream pop audience. And by the mid-50s, rhythm and blues was being played on commercial white radio stations across America. Advertisers didn't care what color the musicians were if their music helped sell products. And now let me tell you about McTavish's Skinless Weenies. Mmm, -hmm. So long, so pink, so flavor rich with lots of tasty goodness. Mmm, -hmm. Ready, set. In 1956, Little Richard, another pianist from the Deep South, burst onto America's silver screens, and white American parents were horrified. He was moving, and it was about he has arrived. Every molecule in the place should know that Richard has arrived. He made sure of that. I mean, 
mean, my mom didn't like it because she, she, that was just too sexy. What we, talk, you know, we don't talk about tutti frutti at the den, dinner table. It was too uninhibited. It was too loose. It was too sweaty. As rhythm and blues crossed racial and class boundaries, what had been an exclusively black sound was now becoming part of the white way of life. This transformation was largely down to an enterprising white DJ named Alan Freed, who took rhythm and blues and rebranded it for the white audience. He called it rock and roll. I'm guilty of being present at the birth of rock and roll, a music which is the honest, spontaneous expression of today's youth. I'm going to say this and I'm going to shut up about it, okay? I promise I will never say it again. Rock and roll is the white version of rhythm and blues, okay? No, I mean, this is not no prejudice thing, so don't go there, all right? I'm just telling you the real truth. Rock and roll is the offshoot of black rhythm and blues. Like Little Richard says, the music was called R&B, and they had a baby called rock and roll. Teenagers across America were being seduced by the wild and uninhibited sound of rock and roll. For some, this was evidence that black culture was starting to threaten the fabric of white society. So when rock and roll hit, when you had Alan Freed out there talking about like putting on, putting, you know, black records on white radio, that was, that was a little much for, for, for the genteel folks. The obscenity and vulgarity of the rock and roll music is obviously a means by which the white man and his children can be driven to the level with the negro. Rock and roll has got to go, and go it does. That's the best way I know to get rid of it. Safe. Sanitized versions of rhythm and blues classics were produced by white artists like Georgia Gibbs for the white audience. I had a song called Three Letters that was covered by Georgia Gibbs. And I was invited to come on Alan Freedom's uh, show on the radio. And she was there too, do you know? But they made her sing my song. I had to sing something else. That's where that was. I just didn't want her singing my song, Roll With Me, Henry. Fifteen years old, they thought, your song is too suggestive. I said, too suggestive? Oh, because I was saying, Roll With Me, Henry. That's why Georgia Gibbs, they took the record and gave it to Georgia Gibbs, because Georgia Gibbs said, Dance With Me, Henry. Get out in that kitchen and rattle those pots and pans. One after another, R&B hits were cleaned up and turned into rock and roll, with artists like Bill Haley attaining the fame and fortune that had always eluded Big Joe Turner. There is a big difference, if you really listen to the music, between the two styles. One is more pure, one is more dirty. The blues, the rhythm and blues has got more toe jam in it. You understand what I mean? The rock and roll is a little more pure and clean. You with that? Yeah. All right. <laughs> As rock and roll swept white America, the black artists who had brought it to the mainstream would gradually be squeezed out of the popular charts. Still struggling to break through, Ray Charles developed a habit for a drug that made the pressures of the music business fade into the background. Heroin. We never discussed this drug problem. There were some things you didn't talk to Ray about. I knew about it. But we never discussed his drug problem. There were times when he did some nasty things to, to get it, you know, he would send the girls to go, go get the drugs for him and things like that. 
and it would be all squabbles in the band because of course he couldn't see and someone would have to inject him. Well, and so is someone stealing a little piece for themselves? It, it, it created tension and problems in the band and people would get fired and come back. It was only a matter of time before Ray Charles would get busted for his drug addiction and the authorities chose to make an example of him. The cops invited the press in when he was first being interrogated, and he was, it must have been a very vulnerable moment. He was crying, and, and that was one of the few times that ever Ray Charles sort of broke down in public. But all he would say then is, nobody put me on drugs. I put myself on them, and I took myself off of them. Fighting his addiction, and at the lowest point of his life, Ray Charles committed himself to turning his back on the past. Ray was not alone in trying to make a new start. From coast to coast, black Americans were beginning to question their place in society and to define a new black identity. Ah, baby, when you sigh, when you sigh, the church sigh, played a central role in the burgeoning civil rights movement and preachers, including the young Dr. Martin Luther King, encouraged black people to take pride in their race and their history, to be vocal and to rejoice in the good news of the gospel. It was from the church that Ray Charles would find new inspiration. And I went back to what my mom always tried to preach to me. Son, whatever you do in this life, be yourself. I just started taking my music and singing it the way I felt it. And of course, it had so much gospel sound to it. But that was the way I felt. You know, that was part of my uh, growing up. I was raised in the church. And, uh, and of course, religious music is just basically simple music. You see, he loved gospel singing. And uh, every chance he would get, whenever he would be around some of the gospel groups, the singing groups, he would uh, go up and join these guys in the hotels and different places and he would be singing, go with them and be singing, because I think that was probably one of his first loves. Dating as far back as the days of slavery, the church was the one place that black Americans were free. That's where the heart of the black men and women is and was, because there was really no other place that we had for real expression at that time. That's the music that gave all of our great artists Regardless to if they're singing jazz, I don't care what they're singing. If you go back into their backgrounds, their uncle was a preacher, their father was a minister, their mother was a missionary, and all they really know is they read the Bible, they prayed, and they sang these hymns, and they got a cross. Ray Charles was starting to find a new voice, and it came not from Saturday night, but Sunday morning. Here he was, this cautious, trained musician who loved all the big, smooth singers, but then hearing these gospel screamers who would just go, ah, Jesus, you know. He was thinking, this is raw, uninhibited self-expression. This isn't the careful jazz knowing your chords. This is just bellowing. That well, is very much gospel, and Ray Charles had things like that all over the place. You know. Gospel, Ray Charles, couldn't separate the two. <laughs> 